So as we talk in the previous lectures, we take the cardiovascular physiology, we talk a little bit about the cardiac output and how we calculate it, heart rate multiplied by the strong volume, and we talk what is the difference. We talk about what is the difference between the cardiac output and the stroke volume as well. And the FIC principle, the main arterial pressure and the pulse pressure were, were discussed in the previous lectures. Okay, I want to say something here, which is during the early stages of the exercise, in the early stages of the exercise, as you know, in the exercise, we need to increase our heart cardiac output. We need to increase our cardiac output because when we do exercise, our muscles need more oxygen. So our muscles, our tissues may need you more oxygen. That's why we need to increase the cardiac output in the heart. So how we will increase the cardiac output? Of course, by the stroke volume, increasing the stroke volume and the heart rate and thus we will increase the cardiac output but after a while by increasing the heart rate and the stroke volume after a while you have the maximized stroke volume which is the milli of blood that is ejected per beat the millis okay or the volume of blood in millis that it is ejected from the heart in beat, bear one beat of the heart. This is the stroke volume. After a while, you will find that the stroke volume is reach the maximum. You can't eject more blood in each beat. It's only 80 milli, for example, okay? So it's only 80 millis in one beat, for example. You can't go higher than this volume. So you maximize the stroke volume but you still need to increase your heart, your cardiac output. How you will increase the cardiac output when your stroke volume is stabilized now, reach the plateau, okay? Reach the plateau, the maximum volume is reached. So how you will increase the cardiac output? You are needing more oxygen, you will increase the heart rate. So, during the early stages of exercise, the cardiac output is maintained by increasing the heart rate and the stroke volume in early stages. But during the late stages of exercise, the cardiac output is maintained by increasing in the heart rate only. The heart rate only, okay? And as you know, diastole is shortened when the heart rate is increased the heart rate is increased, this means you are beating blood more times. So the systolic is more working more than the diastolic. Okay? In the diastole, if you have imagined that, you are beating the blood more than filling it. You are ejecting the blood out to the aorta more then you are filling it with the blood. Okay? Thus will make ventricular, that, this will make less filling time, less blood in the heart because of the increase in the heart rate. يعني بطريقة أخرى إن إحنا بنضخ دم بشكل أسرع عدد ضربات القلب أكثر فما في وقت يعبي القلب دم ما في وقت للتعبئة الدم داخل القلب لأن أنت بتضخ أكثر عندك الهارت ريت عالي so the diastolic filling time is less and this is what happened in the ventricular tachycardia the ventricle, ventricular tachycardia يعني عدد ضربات القلب اللي بالventricle بضخ دم أكثر ما بيعبي okay? this is what happened in the ventricular tachycardia And of course, we talk about the cardiac output stroke volume, as you know, thick principle, intracardiac shunt, and all of this, the main arterial pressure, the pulse pressure, and so on.
And we talk about the stroke volume, what are the variables that affect the stroke volume? Okay, what are the factors that affect the stroke volume? Like the contractility, the increase in the preload affect the stroke volume. Decrease in the afterload will increase the stroke volume. If the afterload decreased, the stroke volume increased. And we talk about the contractility. What increases the contractility? What decreases the contractility? And we start talking about this one. The beta blocker, beta 1 blocker, how it is decreased the contractility. Let's see here again. How the beta blocker decreases the contractility. Now, as we know here, this beta 1 receptor is needed. When beta-1 receptor is activated by the norepinephrine, which is adrenaline, we have sympathetic nerve here, which give us adrenaline. Now, the adrenaline here, if it is activated, this beta-1 receptor, this beta-1 will activate the CAMB, and we need CAMB to do contraction. Let's see how. Now, beta-1 receptor activate the CAMB. It will increase the CAMB. Thus, you will have increase in the calcium. When you have increase in the calcium, you will increase the contraction. If you block this one, you give drugs like beta-1 blocker that block this one, propanolol, for example, you block beta-1 receptor, so you will decrease the contraction. This is how the beta-1 blocker decreases the contraction. It will Decrease the CAMB and thus decrease the calcium. Decrease the calcium in the intracellularly dual chalia. If the calcium decreases intracellular, it will cause less contraction. Okay, this is how the beta one blocker action or act. Now the contractility and the stroke volume decrease with acidosis. What does acidosis? What does the acidosis here, how does the acidosis affect the contractility? Now, acidosis here, okay, the BH in the blood is decreased. So, this is how you have acidosis. If you have acidosis, how this acidosis will affect the cardiovascular system? First, it will decrease the cardiac contractility. Okay, decrease the contractility. The acidosis will decrease the contractility. Also, it will decrease the responsiveness of the cardiovascular to the catecholamines. What we say that the catecholamines, why we need the catecholamines? Because as we say, the catecholamines, which is the norepinephrine and epinephrine, will activate the muscle and make it contract. It will make the muscle contract. How? By activating the beta-1 receptor here. As you know, this norepinephrine, which is the catecholamine, will activate this beta-1. And when this beta-1 receptor is activated, that will increase the CAMB. And thus, this will increase the calcium. And by increasing the calcium in this cell, you will make more contraction. Okay? So if we have acidosis, in case we have acidosis here, this will decrease the responsiveness to the catecholamines. Begin has a the receptor in the catecholamines, the norepinephrine. So let's contraction. Okay? Now decrease three shot for erythema. Decrease the three shot for erythema. If we have acidosis, now reduction of the cardiac output also, the acidosis will result in, it will decrease the contractility. You have less contractility, so less cardiac output, less blood pressure, decrease the cardiac output will result in less blood pressure and, of course, end organ perfusion. Okay? In organ perfusion, the perfusion for the organs, we have hypotension, which is decreased blood pressure, hypotension, 
how the tissues will get refused if you have hypertension. So of course you will have if organ refusion is decreased, okay? In cases you have acidosis. So these are the effects of acidosis on the cardiovascular contractility. And of course, another thing which is here, acidosis produce a decrease in the myofilaments calcium responsiveness, okay? What does this mean? Well, the myofilaments are the actin and the myosin, okay? The actin and the myosin, which is all the myofilaments in the muscle. You all know that in the muscle there is actin and myosin. In these myofilaments, if we have acidosis, if we have low pH, these myofilaments, act, actin and myosin, will risk less response to the calcium. Calcium. So thus you will have less contractility as well, less cardiac output, less blood pressure, less perfusion of the organs. Now, in case we have hypoxia, which is decreasing the oxygen, we have decreasing the oxygen, you have hypoxia, what will happen? Hypoxia, hypercapnia, we know that hypercapnia means increasing the CO2. Increasing the CO2, we call it hypercapnia, okay? And hypoxia, hypo, hypo decrease. Hypoxia is decreasing the oxygen, okay? So, in case we have hypoxia, decreasing the oxygen, and hypercapnia, increasing the CO2, you will have low oxygen, which lead to demand supply mismatch. The muscle is needing oxygen, but you don't supply it with enough oxygen. You have hypoxia, you have decreasing the oxygen amount. So the muscle or any tissue need oxygen, but you don't supply it. This is what we call demand supply mismatch. That will cause decrease in the contractility, of course. This is how the hypoxia and hypercapnia. This is how the hypoxia and the hypercapnia affect the contractility. Now, let us talk about this one, the non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers. How this non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker affect the contractility? Why does these drugs affect the contractility? From the name of the drug, as you can see, it is a calcium channel blocker. It will block the calcium from entering the cell. If we don't have enough intracellular calcium in the cell, if we don't have enough calcium in the cell, you will have less contractility, okay? You need more calcium in the cell to have enough contractility. Yes, as we know. So this is how the non dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker work. It's a block the channel, and if it is a block the calcium channel, less calcium is entered to the cell, so less contractility. Now let's see how in more details. Now this is here, we have two types of a drug, as we know. The dihydropyridines, calcium channel blocker, and the non-dihydropyridines calcium channel blocker. Now what are the dihydropyridines? How does they work? Now, the difference between these two, the dihydropyridines, calcium channel blocker, and the non dihydropyridines calcium channel blocker, so both of them are calcium channel blocker. What are the difference between them? The difference is that the dihydropyridines is affect more on the vaso, on the blood vessels, okay? So we have here the blood vessel, and this is Dihydropyridine effect on the blood vessel. So as we know that in the blood vessel you have smooth muscles. If you have smooth muscles in the blood vessel and you give calcium channel blocker, so less calcium will enter to this blood vessel wall or muscle, so it will have vasodilatation. راح تتوسع لأنه العضلات ما فيها كالسيوم ما فيها إشي تعمل تون. And vasoconstriction, so it will cause vasodilatation. If you don't have calcium in these muscles, that will cause vasodilatation. 
And this is how the dihydroburdenes work. As you can see here, so the dihydroburdenes more effect in the vasodilatation. It will cause vasodilatation because it affects the blood vessels, and it have less effect on, on the heart function. So it don't affect the heart, the dihydroburdenes, but it affects the blood vessels. While on the other hand, you have non-dihydroburdenes. The non-dihydroburdenes affect what? Affect the heart. So a more effect on the heart function. Okay, so let's see how. Now here we have the smooth muscles in the blood vessel. This is the blood vessel, the arterial blood vessel, and this is the smooth muscles. This is here the calcium chain in the smooth muscles in the blood vessel. And this one, dihydroburdenes, calcium channel blocker, it's bind to and it block the calcium channel blocker. It block the calcium channels. If the calcium channels are blocked, what will happen? Calcium cannot enter the muscle cells. So what will happen? It will cause vasodilatation. And of course, if we have vasodilatation, it will affect the blood vessel. It will affect the blood vessel. It will affect the blood So thus, you will have vasodilatation. And as a consequence, you will have decrease in the blood pressure, high blood tension. Okay, so what next? What are they used for? For what we use the dihydroburdenes calcium channels? We use them, of course, if we have something constrict the vessels, or we have hypertension and we want to have hypotension. So we use these dihydroburdenes calcium channel blocker to decrease the tone or the pressure in the vessels. Like if we have hypertension, we will give this dihydroburdenes calcium channel blocker. If we have hypertension, but if we have not the dihydroburdenes block the calcium channel and thus vasodilatation, and thus you will have hypertension. So to treat the hypertension, hypertension, to treat it, you will give dihydroburdenes calcium channel blockers. What else? For renewed phenomena, renewed phenomena, this one is in the cold. You have your toes and your fingers will have vasoconstriction in the cold. Okay, here you have your fingers. This one is your finger. In the cold, you have cold weather. The vessels get constricted. Okay, in your fingers and the toes. So the vasoconstriction you have vasoconstriction in the fingers if you have cold and this vasoconstriction by this vasoconstriction you will have less perfusion to your tissues less perfusion to the tissues that will make this digit هذا الطرف من اليد راح يكون بيل شاحب and it could be cyanosed ممكن يصير لون ازرق this what we call it renewed phenomena or renoid syndrome, okay? So you have renoid syndrome. What you will use to vasodilate these vessels? You will use, of course, the dihydroburdenes calcium channel. But what's for high level demo here? more blood going to your tissues, hand tissue. And so what will happen next? More perfusion to these tissues because you have more calcium and more vasodilatation. Less calcium and less, less calcium and thus vasodilatation and more perfusion to your tissues. Okay, this is how you treat the brainoid phenomenon or syndrome. You will give them calcium channel blockers, dihydroburdenes calcium channel blockers. Now, what about the non dihydroburdenes calcium channel blocker that we are talking about in this lecture? Non dihydroburdenes are working more on the heart function. So, the heart muscle it will block the calcium in the heart muscle. So it would block the calcium going into the muscle of the heart. Of course, it will decrease the contractility. And this is how the non dihydroburdenes work. Okay. Now we are talking about the myocardial oxygen demand. 
what affect or increase the myocardial oxygen demand. The myocardial is the cardiac muscle, as you know. So the myocardium is the cardiac muscle. What increase this cardiac muscle oxygen demand? Why it will need more oxygen? Why this muscle could need more oxygen? Of course, if you have more contraction, contraction if you have more contraction, you will have more oxygen demand. This muscle will need more oxygen demand. There is more contraction here. If you have more afterload, and what we say about the afterload, it is the pressure that the heart need to bump against. الضغط كمية الضغط اللي القلب بده يضخ عكسها اللي هي this afterload is the pressure in the art in the aorta. Okay? الضغط أو الموجود بالأورطة بالشريان الأبهر في ضغط أصلا قبل ما أنا أضخ إلى الدم فأنا لازم لو كان الضغط جوا الأورطة أقل بقدر أضخ بسهولة دم فتخيلوا إن عندي بالأورطة اللي هو الأفتر لود هو الضغط جوا الأورطة بنسميه أفتر لود so, عندي بالضغط أنا الأفتر لود عندي عالي إذا كان عندي الأفتر لود عالي بالأورطة الضغط عندي بالأورطة عالي so, أنا بدي قوة زيادة and more force and more contraction to bump this blood out to the aorta عشان أضخ الدم من القلب للأورطة اللي فيه ضغط عالي فبدي قوة أعلى وقوة أكبر and when we say more force if we have more after load so we need more force to bump this blood out of the heart so more force of course more oxygen needed so more force so more oxygen is needed this why increasing the afterload will increase the oxygen demand of the muscle of the cardiac muscle now what about increasing the heart rate of course when you are increasing the heart rate you are contract more because what is the beat what is the heart rate it's the amount of beat per minute كم مرة القلب بضخ بالدقيقة؟ So more beat, more pump out the blood, okay? More contraction, more oxygen demand from the myocardial muscle, okay? This is how the heart rate increases the oxygen demand of the cardiac muscle because it will cause more contraction. It need more contraction to do more heart rates or more heart beat. Yes, so this is how you need oxygen. Now, if the diameter of the ventricles increase, now this one, now this one here, if we have increase in the diameter of the ventricle, we have more wall tension, more tension on the muscles, so the muscles will need more oxygen this is how i want you to understand it look at this one here this one talks that more diameter of the ventricle we have more tension if we have more diameter so this ventricle is expand القطر تبع الدائرة بكبر أو القطر تبع الـ ventricles بيكبر what we understand that the ventricles expand so more wall tension you see here the pressure the more it expand the more you have the pressure on the walls you see here the pressure on the walls so if we have more pressure on the walls more wall tension if you have more tension on the walls you need more oxygen okay you have more tension on the muscles, so the muscles need more oxygen, of course. This is how the more diameter, the more volume, because the volume, more volume, will increase the diameter. If we have more volume, so we have more diameter, so more pressure in the ventricles, so more wall tension that's applied on these muscles. Okay, so you need more oxygen, of course. Okay, so now wall tension follows what? 
follows a law called Laplace law. This Laplace law is this one, which is the wall tension equal what? Equal the pressure. The more the pressure, as you see, the more wall. Of course, it will be more wall tension. More the pressure, more wall tension. Look here, you have more pressure. If you have more pressure, this is the pressure here. The more pressure, more tension on the walls. The walls will have more tension. So, more oxygen is needed, as you know. Okay? This is the Laplace law. More tension, more pressure, more tension. What else? If you have the radius, the radius is increased. The ventricle gets expanded. So the ventricle gets expanded, more pressure, more radius, which is the diameter increased, it expands. So of course you will need more oxygen. And of course you will have more wall tension. Okay? More wall tension. So what about the other variables in Laplace law? Let us see what is the wall thickness. Now here if you have the wall thickness, this one, imagine that you have more muscles. If you have more muscle, muscles in this ventricular wall, so this is the thickness, this is the wall thickness. All of that is the thickness of the wall. You have more muscles, hypertrophied muscles, for example. Okay, if you have more thickness, more muscles, the tension will decrease. The tension on the wall will decrease, of course. If you have more muscle, so the tension on this wall will decrease down. So this is that's why it is inversely proportional for the wall tension. The thickness of the wall is inversely proportional for so for what? This is here, if you decrease the wall thickness, you will increase the wall tension. If you increase the wall thickness, you have more muscles, thus you have more thickness in the wall, so of course you will have less tension on this wall, less pressure on this wall, okay? So thus, this is the Laplace law. Now let us move to the next. Variable, which is here, preload. What is the preload? The preload is approximated by ventricular and diastolic volume. And diastolic volume. This means what? After the heart is filling, the filling phase ends. When the filling phase ends, this is the preload. Okay? We can approximate how much is the preload by knowing. What is the volume after the diastolic phase end? The filling phase end. What is the volume in the heart? If we know the volume of the heart after the filling phase end, so we fill already, we finish filling the heart. Now we know the volume, this volume, which is the end diastolic volume. From the end diastolic volume, we can approximate and estimate how much is the preload. Depend on the preload depend on the venous tone and the circulating blood volume. Of course, you know that the preload, which is the volume or the pressure in the venous system, it will depend on what? It's in the venous system. The preload, when a major قلب يعبدم, okay? Preload, the heart from the venous blood in abdomen. Okay, this is here the preload. The more volume, the cancer or the blood in the veins that's coming to the heart, in the veins that's coming to the heart, more blood volume in this veins, more preload we have. Okay, more blood in this vessels or in this veins that's coming to the to the heart. So you have more preload, of course. Now, again, 
So the preload approximated by ventricular and diastolic volume, as we say, which is the end of the filling phase. And this preload, depending on the vein stone and the circulating blood volume, the blood that is coming to the heart by the veins, this determines the preload. Okay, the more blood in the veins that's coming to the heart, so we have more preload. Now, venodilators, okay, the pressure in the vein give us the pressure in the vein give us the preload. So if we decrease this pressure in the vein by giving the nitroglycerin. If we give the nitroglycerin to decrease the pressure in the vein, thus we will decrease the preload. So if we want to decrease the preload, we will give a drug that decreases the venous pressure. Okay? Like what? Like the nitroglycerin. If we want to decrease the preload, we will give nitroglycerin because nitroglycerin decreases the pressure of the venous system. Okay, now let us take a look on the preload. Here is the preload. The volume of blood in ventricles at end of the diastolic pressure increased in hypervolemia, regurgitation of the cardiac valves, and the heart failure. Now again, what is the preload? After this, Volume, this blood that comes from the vein, fill this ventricle, okay? Fill this ventricle with, this is the preload, okay? The end diastolic volume. So the volume of blood in the ventricles at the end diastolic volume. What does this mean? يعني نفسه كمية السائل اللي بنحسبها بعد ما يتعب القلب من الفينز خلاص انتهت مرحلة التعبئة. The end of the diastole. ليش بتصير التعبئة بالديستول? So the end نهاية الديستول. This is the preload, okay? And this committed them on who the preload. Now, this volume of the blood increase in which cases? It will increase if we have hypervolemia. If we have more volume of blood, of course, this will increase. More blood coming to the heart. Like when we give more fluid. Atina fluid ktir. To the patient. So we have hypervolemia, thus you will increase the preload. But the complete the cell is present in the heart before the process of breathing. Okay, after the end of the process of You will increase this phase. The end diastolic volume will increase if you have hypervolemia. You will give more fluids to the patient. Now, in this, if the case of regurgitation of the cardiac valves, now the valves. Now, the aortic valve or the pulmonary valve, for example, here, you have the pulmonary valve. You give him, you give this pulmonary valve, you give it the blood, you eject the blood to it, but the valve, there is a problem in the valve, so it will return back the blood. So, bad is to the Samam Fatih. بعد ما يقل الضغط على البلمونري رح يرجع كل الدم for the ventricle for the right ventricle so إذا رجع الدم اللي أنا أصلاً أرسلته للبلمونري this will increase the preload زاد كمية السائل أو الدم داخل الventricle more volume in the ventricle so more preload okay so the regurgitant or the regurgitation of the valves إنه الفالف بيرجع the blood, okay? Call the valve fat, فبيرجع the blood, regurgitation. So the regurgitant or the regurgitation of the cardiac valves, this will increase the preload. Now, and of course the heart failure. When the heart failure, you don't have the contraction force, less contraction force. إنت ما عندك قوة لتضغط تنقبض العضلة وترسل كمية دم كافية فأكثر دم بيضل داخل القلب لأنه أنت ما عندك عندك heart failure فشل بالقلب فشل بالقلب less contraction force 
And if you have less contraction force, of course, you will have less blood is ejected from the heart. So more blood stays in the heart and so in the ventricles and so more preload, of course. So the preload increases if you have hypervolemia, regurgitation of the heart valves, and the heart failure. And the preload itself is the blood or the volume in the ventricles in the end diastolic volume after the filling phase is end. Okay. And if we want to decrease this preload, what we will give? Nitroglycerin. Okay. Now the afterload here. The afterload approximated by the main arterial pressure. Increasing the afterload will increase the pressure, will increase the wall tension per lab less low. We know that if the pressure increase, this will increase the wall tension in the lab less low. Here is it. You have more pressure in the ventricles, more wall tension, and thus, this is how the blast flow works. Now the left ventricular compensate for increasing afterload by thickening hypertrophy in order to decrease the wall tension. This is a very simple idea. Now, as we know that the afterload is the main arterial pressure approximated by it. We can estimate the afterload by the mean arterial pressure. Now, what is the afterload itself? We know that the afterload is the pressure in the arteries. Yes, the pressure in the artery is the afterload. Now, the main arterial pressure, which is the average, the average pressure in this arteries, is the same as the afterload because we know that the afterload is the pressure in the arteries. So now the pressure in the arteries will cause what? Now you have, you want to push the blood to a place that it is have a higher pressure, from low pressure to a higher pressure. Okay, so instead or to do that, you will need to increase your pressure in the ventricle. You will increase your pressure in the ventricle. And thus, how you will increase this pressure in the ventricle? You will do wall thickness. Okay? So, we see hypertrophied to increase this pressure or to compensate because you have high pressure. You have higher afterload, increasing the pressure in the artery, and your ventricle want to, bu to push out the blood against this artery that have high pressure. So what it will do? Here is a low pressure, want to go to a higher pressure area. It will increase its muscles, yes? It will do hypertrophy of the muscles. The muscle thickness will increase. So you have more force, more pressure to push out this blood out to the aorta, okay? So you can have high pressure and a pressure more than the aorta, so you can push out this blood to the aorta, okay? Increasing the afterload, increasing the pressure, so you, you have a increase in the wall tension. You have here increasing the pressure, increase, and the pressure will cause increase in the wall tension. So if you want to decrease the tension of the walls, the walls of the heart, increase tension of the walls of the heart, you want to decrease this wall tension. You want to decrease this wall tension, what you will do? You will increase the wall thickness. 
So you increase the pressure, increase the wall thickness, but because you increase the wall thickness, the wall tension will decrease. decrease. Okay? So the wall the tension will decrease because you increase the thickness of the muscle. Thus you have more pressure, but less tension on the walls because you have increased the thickness of the wall itself. Okay. And this is what you will see here. Lift particular compensates for increasing the afterload by doing what? Thickening of hypertrophy of the muscle to decrease the wall tension. And of course, you will increase the pressure. You want to increase the pressure, but in the same time, you don't want to increase the, the tension on the walls. You don't want to increase the tension on the walls, but also you want to increase the pressure. What you will do? You will increase the muscle thickness. And this is how you increase the pressure of the ventricle and also decrease this wall tension. Okay? So now the vasodilators, you want to decrease, you want to decrease this afterload, which is the pressure in the artery, you will give vasodilators, which is, will make dilatation in the vessels in the, in the, Arteries, the latitude of the arteries, so you will decrease the afterload. كل ما توسع الفيزل قل الضغط جوا صح كل ما توسع الوعاء الدموي أو الشريان بقل الضغط داخل هذا الشريان وبالتالي بيقل عندنا the afterload which is the pressure in this artery بقل. So if we want to decrease this afterload, what we will get vasodilators like what hydrolyzine. The hydrolyzine you have two A here. So you can know that this is for the artery, decreasing the artery pressure. So you have here, hydrolyzine decreases the afterload by decreasing the pressure in the artery or the blood vessels. Okay, so you have here, hydrolyzine to decrease the afterload and ACE inhibitors and ARPs decrease both the preload and the afterload. Now, why the ACE inhibitors and the ARPs decrease both the preload and the afterload? What we mean by that? It decreases the volume in the veins, but gets the amount of blood that is present in the vessels, in the blood, and in the preload, which is the pressure in the veins. The pressure in the blood. We said that it is the preload. Right? It is the same amount of blood that will enter into the ventricles. In the end, the systolic volume. So, كيف بدنا نقلل البريلود والافترلود معا والافترلود يعني كمان الضغط الموجود بالشريان كيف بدنا نقلله بنقلل السوائل فإذا قللنا السوائل أكيد الضغط اللي جوا الوريد كمان حيقل واللي جوا الافترلود اللي هو الجوا الشريان حيقل إذا قللنا السوائل بالشريان وبالوريد شو راح يصير بيقل عندي الاثنين الافترلود and the preload okay So by using what? By using the ACE inhibitors and the ARPs. Now, let us talk a little bit about the ARP, the ARPs and the ACE inhibitors. Now, the ACE inhibitors promote the salty secretion by augmenting the renal blood flow and by reducing the production of aldosterone and antidiuretic hormone. What we mean by that. Now, of course, the ACE inhibitors, what they do? Promote the salt excretion. Salt excretion. Salt, يعني ملح, sodium. Excretion, out of the body. Excretion, اخراج هذا الصوديوم من الجسم. Okay? عن طريق الكلى. The kidney. By the kidney. Okay? So, if we have, we know all that if we have get rid of the sodium, also we are get rid of the water. Okay, so excretion of the sodium and of course excretion of the water. So more volume is getting out of the body, decrease the afterload and decrease also the preload. Okay, and what else the ACE and ARPs do? 
S and Rs also produce the production of aldosterone. What does the aldosterone do? As we know, the aldosterone take out the sodium to the body. Okay? Take this. The aldosterone take the sodium to the body. بمنع إخراج الصوديوم من الجسم. الألديسترون يقوم بامتصاص الصوديوم أو بأخذ الصوديوم ورجع للجسم عشان ما يتم إخراجه عن طريق الكلى. Okay? So this is the function of aldosterone. And of course, if aldosterone take the sodium to the body, it will take also the water, the H2O. Okay? So we will have more volume. But S inhibitors and ARBs Block aldosterone function. It will block it. So you will have less sodium, less water. And the same for antidiuretic hormone. Antidiuretic, when you do diuresis, okay, diuresis is getting out the fluids or the water out of the body. Now, if you use or you, you are inhibiting the antidiuretics. So you you are doing diuresis, okay? The antidiuretic بمنع خروج السوائل من الجسم اسمه anti anti diuretic يعني ضد أو مضاد diuresis, okay? اللي هو ما بخرج سوائل برا الجسم anti diuretic diuresis هو إخراج السوائل خارج الجسم anti diuresis تمنع إخراج السوائل من الجسم so you will have more volume in the blood so more afterload and more preload but you want to decrease the preload and the afterload by doing what? by inhibiting the antidiuretic so you can use, you can do diuresis بتم إخراج السوائل من الجسم okay okay Now, if we have a chronic hypertension, in the case, as we say, if we have afterload, okay, afterload, the artery have hypertension, increasing the pressure in the artery, the artery have hypertension, increasing the pressure in the arteries. This is why the afterload is high. So, as we say that the cardiac muscle will thicken, yes, you will have thickening of the cardiac muscle, the cardiac hypertrophy. If you have cardiac hypertrophy, so what you will have, if you have chronic hypertension, دائما عندي ضغط مرتفع داخل الشريان, دائما عندي ضغط مرتفع داخل الشريان, always I have afterload is high, afterload always is high. What the cardiac muscle will do? It will hypertrophy. So you will have left ventricular hypertrophy. عشان تقدر cardiac muscle تتغلب, okay, and to push out the blood instead of عشان تضغط أو تخرج الدم مع وجود هذا ال pressure العالي بال arteries. How it will do this? كيف بدها تزيد قوتها ال cardiac muscle عشان تحصل على قوة أكبر على pressure أعلى عشان تضخ الدم برغم وجود this high afterload it will increase the muscle thickness so this thus will you will have is that can in chronic hypertension you will have left ventricular hypertrophy عنا دائما ضغط مرتفع وبالتالي القلب مو قادر يضخ الدم في هذا الشريان لأنه دائما ضغطه مرتفع وبالتالي بكبر حجم العضلة cardiac hypertrophy in the left ventricle بالبطين الأيسر بيزيد حجم العضلة عشان يكون عنده قوة كافية ليضخ هذا الدم في مقابل هذا الضغط المرتفع في الشريان. Okay, this is this why if you have chronic hypertension, which is the same as increasing the main arterial cardiac pressure or main arterial pressure, this will cause left ventricular hypertrophy. Now the last thing here, what is the ejection fraction? The ejection fraction, ejection fraction, نسبة الإيجكشن. شو يعني إيجكشن؟ ضخ الدم. نسبة ضخ الدم من الدم كله. Okay. 
So how you will understand this? أنا عندي مثلا كمية سائل محددة بالقلب in the ventricle. كم ضخيت أنا؟ باخد النسبة. This is the ejection fraction. قد إيه مثلا عندي سائل أنا ضخيته مثلا 60 على قد إيه أصلا كان داخل ال ventricle. فهاي النسبة قد إيه أصلا تعبى ال ventricle هي هاي ejection fraction. ejection نسبة الضخ. شو هي نسبة الضخ؟ السائل أو كمية البلد اللي أنا ضخيته على اصلا قد ايه كان موجود blood in the ventricle now this is here in other words which is the ejection fraction is the stroke volume احنا حكينا قبل ان stroke volume هو the milliliters or the volume of blood ejected in each beat كمية السائل او كمية البلد اللي بتم ضخه في كل ضربة للقلب في كل contraction of the heart okay so the stroke volume حكينا انه هو ملي اللي هو السائل حجم السائل over the beat how much ملي I have in each beat this is the stroke volume which is the same as if I eject 60 ملي okay This is what I ejected, and this is the stroke volume over what? What is the all volume in the heart before ejection? At the asan kan sa'il, at the kan the blood abel ma amal dakh le dam. Tamam? Fa kamiyat sa'il or kamiyat blood the lana asan dakhato bil darb el wahd el qal at the dakhat dakhat masan sixteen milli. Tab asan at the kan بالقلب قبلها اللي هو end diastolic volume شو ال end diastolic volume نهاية مرحلة التعبئة أكيد نهاية مرحلة التعبئة هي كل السائل اللي كان بالفنتركل عبيت أنا خلاص تمام اعتبروا إنه هاي مية فأنا قد إيه ضخيت ضخيت خمسين خمسين على مية قد إيه تطلع النسبة خمسين بالمية أوكي The normal ejection fraction is more than 55. It should be more than 55, okay? So the normal ejection fraction, نسبة الدم اللي يضخ لازم القلب يضخ أكثر من النص بكل ضرب إله. أكثر من النص اللي هو معبى فيه. مثلا هو في 100 لازم يضخ أكثر من النص. Okay, more than 50. It should be more than 55 to be accurate. But the blood or the heart should be. It's checked in each beat more than 55 to be healthy or normal. So the ejection normal ejection fraction is the same as 55. More than 55 is normal ejection fraction. The left ventricular ejection fraction is an index of the ventricular contractility. Then we have to know that the power of the ventricles for the for the ventricles more contraction, we will have. More ejection fraction. كمية السائل اللي بيطلع الضرب الواحد حيكون أعلى وبالتالي أكيد النسبة حتكون أعلى. Okay. So if this was six sixty because you have higher contractility, this is sixty over one hundred. In هاد الدم كمية الدم اللي كان موجود أصلاً بالقلب أنا ضخيت ستين بدل ما أضخ خمسين. زدت ال contraction زدت عملية الضخ قوة الضخ زدتها فضخيت أكثر وبالتالي the contraction higher. The stroke volume higher, and you'll have the ejection fraction, of course, higher. It will be 60 percent. Okay. I hope that you understand. Okay. So yes. In other words, Now, stroke volume over the end diastolic volume equal, which is the end diastolic minus the end systolic. After I finish this stall, how it was? It was 100. And after I eject the blood, it become 40. So how much I eject? What is the stroke volume? 60. Okay, this 60 is over. How much it was in the beginning? How much I felt in this ventricle in the beginning? It was 100. So 60 over 100 
60 percent 60 percent is the Egyptian fraction okay now Now, decreasing the ejection fraction, it will decrease if we have systolic heart failure. You know this. If you have systolic heart failure, this means you have less contraction. Okay, systolic heart failure, meaning have less contraction of the muscles. If we have less contraction of the muscles, you will have the ejection fraction less. Why? Because the stroke volume is less. The amount of the blood that is ejected per minute per, per one beat is low because it's you don't contract very well okay you don't contract very well so you there's no enough blood getting out of the heart so less ejection fraction systolic heart failure systolic heart failure انقباض أقل أكيد كمية الدم اللي حتطلع من القلب أقل، okay? This what we mean if we have ejection fraction low in the systolic heart failure. Now ejection fraction is normal in the systolic heart failure. Okay. Okay. Now, ejection fraction is normal in the diastolic heart failure. Why? Because imagine that you have diastolic heart failure. You don't fill this heart in a appropriate way. contraction is the same force of contraction. Contraction not هدوخ مثلا نص الكمية هدوخ خمسة وعشرين فإماجن ذات خمسة وعشرين على خمسين كم هتطلع خمسين بالمية مع إنه كمية السائل أصلا قليلة إنه كمية السائل قليلة فإن الديستوليك هارت فيليو is affected ولكن هذا الديستوليك هارت فيليو ما أثر على الإجيكشن فراكشن ضلت النسبة نورمال لأنه ضلت نسبة الدم اللي أنا بضخه هي نسبة تناسب أنا عندي دم قليل فرح أضخ قليل أوكي رح أضخ قليل إذا كان عندي دم سائل كتير داخل القلب رح أضخ أكتر إذا ظلت ال contractility ثابتة طبعا إذا كان عندي ال contraction ثابت فحسب كمية السائل عندي السائل أكتر حضخ أكتر عندي السائل أقل حضخ حضخ أقل تمام وبالتالي in the ejection fraction is normal if you have the systolic heart failure because in the systolic heart failure the amount and the ventricle is decreased already. So you will eject only the half of the volume, which is 50%. That's why the ejection fraction is normal in the diastolic heart failure. Now this here, we talk about this wall tension and we talk about the preload, which is the amount of the ventricular stretch. At the end of the day, stool, it also refers to the amount of volume in the ventricle at the end of this phase, as we say. The left atrial filling pressure or the pulmonary artery wedge pressure is used to assist the left ventricular preload. How can a left ventricular preload blood left ventricle? Yes? left ventricle from the left atrium filling pressure لأنه قد ما يتعبى الأتريا the more the أتريا نفس الأذين قد يتعبى الأذين ونفس كمية السائل اللي بتعبى منها الأذين حينزلها وين على left ventricle فأنا لو بدي أعرف قد إيه عندي ال preload بال left ventricle كمية السائل اللي هتكون بال left ventricle قبل عملية الضخ بقدر أقيسها من وين من ال left atrium pressure من الأذين الأيسر لأنه هي نفس كمية السائل أو كمية البلد اللي موجودة بالأذين الأيسر رح تنزل على البطين الأيسر فأنا بقدر أقيسها من هون قد إيه عندي بلد وأعرف قد إيه عندي بريلود from the left atrium okay now 
or from the pulmonary artery with pressure لأنه كمية السائل أصلا اللي رايح للرئة وراجع للقلب ونفسه كمية السائل اللي أنا حنزله أو كمية البلد نفسه اللي حنزله على left ventricle وبالتالي أنا بقدر أقيسها من pulmonary artery البلمونري ارتري اللي هو البلمونري الارتري اللي رايح على البلمونري اللي طالع من الرايت فينتريكل اوكي كميه السائل اللي طلعت من الرايت فينتريكل رايحه للبلمونري هي نفس الكميه اللي حترجع للقلب ويتم وبعدين تنزل للليفت فينتريكل سو so انا بقدر اعرف البري لود اوف ذا ليفت فينتريكل باي ميجرينج ذا فيلينج ذا ليفت اتريال فيلينج بريشر اور اولسو فروم ذا بلمونري ارتري ويتش بريشر is used to assist the left ventricular preload as we say the right atrial pressure is used to assist the right ventricular preload and as we know we know this one we can guess that if we guess if we measure the pressure in the left or the right atrium is an guess the pressure or كمية السائل الموجود داخل الأذين الأيمن بقدر أعرف قد ايه البريلود لأنه هو نفسه كمية السائل اللي حتنزل تحت على ال right ventricle فأنا بقدر أعرف ال preload of the right ventricle by measuring the pressure in the volume in the right atrium okay this is what this slide is about now this is here talking about the crank starting low The Frank starting law states that the stroke volume of the left ventricle will increase as the left ventricle volume increases due to the myocyte stretch causing a more forceful systolic contraction. What does this mean? Now this one here, Frank starting law, is you have here the stroke volume and you have here the ventricular and the systolic volume, which is The preload. The stroke volume of the left ventricle will increase. Of course, the left ventricle volume increase. You know that. That if we have more volume, which is more preload, we have more preload in the left ventricle here. This is the left ventricle, and you have more blood. Okay, more blood. More preload, okay? More volume. So of course, if we have more volume, you will eject more blood. The ejection of more blood, this is the same as stroke volume. Stroke, يعني الضربة, the beat. How many beats in the minute? Okay. Stroke معناها beat. One beat is the same as stroke. Stroke. Volume. A day I'm gonna pull volume. A day I'm gonna pull milliliter of blood in one beat. This is the stroke volume. And of course, I'm gonna pull milliliter more in each beat. If I have more blood, I'm gonna pull more volume. This is the stroke volume. More milliliters. I will get out from the heart if I have more blood in the heart, of course. Okay. This is what is the Frank Starling law is about. Let us see it in the other words also. As you can see here, this is the ventricular and diastolic volume. Volume, كمية السائل, okay? كمية blood in the ventricle. Oh, here you have stroke volume, which is, أو هي نفسها كمان cardiac output لأنه كمية السائل اللي حتطلع per one minute is the same as يعني نفس النسبة إذا زادت كمية ضخ الدم في one beat. Okay, السائل زاد اللي بضخه في one beat أكيد راح يزيد كمية السائل اللي بنضخ في دقيقة كاملة. Okay, so from here, the cardiac output equals stroke volume multiplied by the heart rate. This is beat per minute, and this one is here the milliliters of volume for blood per beat. One beat only. This is the stroke volume, okay? While the cardiac output is beat goes with beat in milliliter over minute, which is to become liter, okay? 
So milliliters, which is liters, you will take it in liter actually. Liter over minute, this is the cardiac output, okay? So if the stroke volume increase, the milliliter per one beat increase, of course it will increase the amount of volume in the amount of volume in one minute. In one beat, the volume increase. Of course, in one minute, the volume will increase also. So this is how the stroke volume and the cardiac output are the same in the concept. Okay? Now, you have here the ventricular and the stroke volume. This is the volume. And this is the stroke volume or cardiac output. If the volume increase, this is the normal one. As the volume increase, the stroke volume increase or the cardiac output increase. Here you have the stroke volume, the volume increase, the stroke volume increase. Here's the volume is more than this one. If we have only two points, the volume here is higher. Yes, here you have the volume, higher volume. Higher cardiac output. If we have less volume, like in here, less cardiac output. Okay? So the more volume you will have, the more cardiac output you will have. Okay? This is the normal curve. This is what about the Frank Starling law is about. Okay? Now let us see if we have force of contraction is proportional, as we say, to the end diastolic length of cardiac muscle fiber. What we mean by the force of contraction is proportional في علاقة طرديه مع end diastolic length of cardiac muscle fiber. كل أكيد مزاد الطول المصل تبع ال ventricle لأنها تعبت أكثر صار عليها tension أكثر فزاد طولها. طول العضلة فأكيد لما تيجي تعمل contraction مستعدة هي تعمل contraction طول طول زاد طولها كتير okay so when it will contract it will contract with more force that's why كل ما زاد الفوليوم زاد المسل فايبر لينجث that's why when it will contract it will contract in more force okay Force of contraction is proportional to the end diastolic length of the cardiac muscle fiber, which is the same as the preload. More preload, more force of contraction. More volume, more force of contraction. If we have more force of contraction, of course you will have more stroke volume and more cardiac output because you have more volume of blood in one minute. Now, increasing the contractility with catecholamines like norepinephrine, adrenaline, and positive ion tropes like digoxin, we, we talk about this one. Now, if we have digoxin as we're here, if you have catecholamines, adrenaline increase in the exercise, you have the adrenaline increase in the exercise. So, what will happen? Look here. You have more contraction force, more contractility. Thus, you will increase the stroke volume. The cardiac output is increasing. You have here in the exercise, you have adrenaline. More adrenaline, you will increase the cardiac output. Okay? Here is the normal one. Here is the one with exercise or catecholamines and so on. Now, if you give the positive Ionotropes, the digoxin. Look here about the difference between these two. This one with heart failure. You look to this one with heart failure. The patient with heart failure can't contract well. ما بقدر يضخ أو ينقبض عضلات قلب منيح لأنه عنده فشل قلبي. عضلات القلب for any reason it can't contract well. ما بتقدر تنقبض منيح إذا ما بتقدر تنقبض ما بتضخ دم أصلاً برا. If it can't eject the blood out of the heart, so you have more volume. And that's why they have a lot of blood that is more than the heart because they are not able to go out. So this you will have in the heart failure. You have more volume. This is here at the start of the big, the beginning of the first or the normal people. Okay, 
This is the beginning of heart failure. Volume. بكون أصلا كتير عنده دائما فوليوم عالي. But it can't contract. So the cardiac output قليل. ما بقدر ينقبل. فما بطلع إشي أصلا. Drill. We don't have volume of blood per minute. Okay. It's less than the normal people. The blood. The volume of blood per minute is decreased, which is the cardiac output. Okay. يكون أقل من النورمال بيشنت. In the normal patient you have this cardiac output is high. Okay. While the heart failure, look at here the cardiac output and the stroke volume decreases because there's no good contractility. But look here if I give this heart failure patient, I give him digoxin, which is an anotropic positive. What if I give this one, the heart failure patient, digoxin? What is the digoxin? It's a drug. This digoxin increase the contractility. Increase the contractility of the heart muscle. When you say increase the contractility, we mean positive ionotropic. It's the same, okay? Positive ionotropic increase the contractility. If we say negative ionotropic, it decreases the contractility, okay? Negative ionotropic effect decreases the contractility. If we say positive, it will increase the contractility, which is the digoxin. One example of the positive ionotropic drugs are the digoxin, increase the contractility of the heart. So here we have one person with heart failure. He can't contract well. Contractility is decreased here, okay? So I, I give him digoxin, which is a drug, to increase the contractility. I increase the contractility by using digoxin in a heart failure patient. So now, do you look at the difference? You found the difference here? The same volume, I have the same volume, but more cardiac output. Because I use digoxin, I have more contractility. The stroke volume and the cardiac output are higher. Okay, the amount of blood that I ejected or the volume of blood is more because I have more contractility. Now, what are the factors that decrease contractility? Or what happens if the contractility decreased? Now we have decrease in the contractility with loss of myocardium, like my MI, MI here, احتشاء القلب, okay? أو الجلطة القلبية. So what happens in this one? You don't have good perfusion to the muscle, the cardiac muscle or the myocardium. You don't have good perfusion. This muscle will die, and this is how you will have MI. So the muscle die. Of course, less contraction, yeah? The muscle die, less contraction. This is what happens in the MI patients, the myocardium infarction patients. And of course, if you use beta blocker, as we say, we say that we talk about this beta blocker, beta 1 blocker, because it decreases the CAMB and decreases the calcium in the cell. Yeah? And decrease the catecholamines, means responsiveness on the beta 1 receptor. So the contractility will decrease. So the contraction will decrease either by the myocardial infarction, the death of the myocardium, or by the beta blocker usage. Okay? And also, as we say, the non dihydroberidine calcium. Of course, the non hydroberidine calcium will decrease as we take that the calcium in the cardiac muscle is important for the contraction. If I block this if this calcium, I prevent it from entering the intracellular myocardium, this will decrease the contraction. So if I use the hydroberidine calcium channel blocker, I prevent the calcium from entering the intracellular compartment and thus decrease the contractility of, as we just say a little minutes before. Now, the last thing here, if we have dilated cardiomyopathy. Dilated cardiomyopathy, 
you will have more volume okay it's like the diastolic heart failure and the dilated cardiomyopathy is different from increasing the muscle thickness okay you have dilated cardiomyopathy the muscles are weakened and thus decrease the contractility okay i hope that you enjoy with us today see you tomorrow i hope that you understand see you tomorrow next time thank you all